I once owned 32 guinea pigs. <laughs> now you may be asking yourself, what does one do with 32 guinea pigs? My answer is this. Oh yes. These are not just any old guinea pigs. They were top of the line, specialty bred, best in show animals. I joined my local 4-H club, a rural youth organization for those of, that are not familiar with it, at age nine, a time when I was deemed too young for the large pig I wanted to show at the fair. It was suggested that I get a rabbit instead, but they seemed cliche. Everyone had a friggin' bunny, I wanted a pig. So I settled for a guinea pig, two actually, running bear and white dove named after a couple in a tragic Native American love story I once heard at Girl Scout camp. I saw these two as soulmates, so my neighbor Rita and I set up an elaborate wedding for them on the bright yellow plastic slide in her front yard, complete with outfits, her two-year-old sister as a flower girl, and vows that we spoke for them. A few weeks later, they had babies but white doves sadly ate out all of their stomachs in a failed attempt to cut their umbilical cords, a sight my parents luckily saved me from seeing. They never got another chance at parenthood. Running bear and white dove died of heat exhaustion before I realized that guinea pigs need air conditioning to survive the Southern California desert summers. After I observed the proper warning period for guinea pigs, which is about a week, I went out and got another one, this time an Abyssinian named Mr. Abby. <laughs> Mr. Abby wasn't the best quality show pig, or KV, the scientific term I had to call them if I didn't want the other breeders to think I was an amateur. But boy, did he have personality. Every time he saw me, he'd squeak, squeak, squeak a hello, and I'd feed him some tasty treat, then we'd cuddle on the couch together or practice our show moves. My whole family loved him, especially my father, who would sit and chat with him through his cage. Occasionally, he'd even take Mr. Abby out to sit on the couch and watch TV with him. Their bond was adorable. What Mr. Abby lacked in looks, he made up for in patience, as I flipped, prodded, and pulled his body to show the judges at the fair. We, there were two predominant ways to show a guinea pig back then, California and Arizona. California style was one-on-one, -on -one, just you and your cavey in front of a judge. Arizona style had a group of five to 10 people, each lined up with their cavey, showing the judge parts of the animals when asked. Since I was the only person around for miles who did this sort of thing, I showed California style at the fair. <laughs> The first year, it was just me. I won all of the awards. <laughs> the second year, it was me and my best friend at the time. I still won all of the awards. <laughs> the third year, my sister joined. She won an award and I threw such a fit that she moved back to only showing horses like before. <laughs> then something absolutely horrible happened. Breeding guinea pigs for the fair caught on. By my fourth year, we had so many participants that we had to switch from California to Arizona style. My easy advantage was gone, and I started losing both the market and the showmanship competitions. I was an uncool, fat, awkward girl. This was the one place in my young world where I dominated and knew more than anyone else around me. I enjoyed having the companionship of other KV enthusiasts, but I wanted to rule as their de facto queen, not compete as their equal. If I wanted to solidify my reign over the small, smelly guinea pig world, I needed to up my game. I needed to have the best animals out there, the ones that would bring me fame and glory at the fair. I would settle for nothing less than best of show. Because competitors wouldn't sell their best quality cavies to me, I had no choice but to breed them myself. I decided I wanted to specialize in Himalayans, a breed that was all white except for black tips of their nose and toes. They were ornery and adorable, just like me. And, and best of all, 
They were rare, so my competition wasn't as fierce as the other breeds. According to the American Rabbit and Katie Breeders Association, the governing body of our shows, a Himalayan needed to look like a brick with rounded edges and got more points the darker the tips of its nose and toes. It was disqualified if black appeared anywhere else on its bright white body. The only Himalayan I was able to buy had a light gray pointed nose. I knew from experience that breeding two Himalayans together would get me a Dalmatian style look, which I definitely didn't want. Instead, I needed to breed a Himalayan with a black pig, then breed those babies with another Himalayan. The process was going to be long, but I was excited for the end result. Perfect, prize-winning Himalayans that would get me best of show at next year's fair. At a show in Arizona, I bought a giant black male guinea pig and two not-so-great quality Himalayan females. As soon as I got home, I invited my pubescent 11-year-old friends over to watch us breed the first two animals. <laughs> it was the first time anyone thought this whole guinea pig thing I did was cool. <laughs> we laughed hysterically at the way the male stuck his dick out and rubbed himself against the sawdust floor of the cage that we decided to do it again immediately with the other Himalayan female. <laughs> 60 days later, we had two abnormally large litters of little black fur balls that spastically ran around the cages on their oversized feet. I was in love. Once these two batches of babies were old enough to breed themselves, I found a Himalayan male and bred the females of the group with him. Perfect Himalayans may have been my breeding obsession, but they weren't the only breed I had. At the time, I was also showing a prize-winning winning golden agouti, which was all black except for golden frosted tips of its hair. It was the 90s. <laughs> One adventurous day, I thought it would be funny to breed him with the original Himalayan mothers and see what happens. So I did. Then I felt badly that the black male and other Himalayan female weren't getting any action, so I bred them too. <laughs> 60 days later, we had 32 guinea pigs. <laughs> it's not easy to find room for 32 guinea pigs, even if most of them are newborn smaller than my palm. After Running Bear and White Dove died of heat exhaustion, we had to move the whole breeding outfit indoors specifically into a room that used to house a hot tub when we moved into this house. A room my parents had spent a lot of money making into an air-conditioned craft room for my mother. A room that was completely taken over by the sights, sounds, and smells of guinea pigs. <laughs> if my mom mourned the loss of her crafting space, she didn't show it. On the contrary, she was as obsessed with guinea pig shows as I was, taking me from town to town all over the desert southwest in our station wagon full of squealing guinea pigs, <laughs> my starch white 4-H uniform laid carefully over the top of their cages. My mother's parents were mostly absent in her life. She never had opportunities like 4-H growing up. 4-H wasn't just her way of giving her children more than she had. It was also her chance to join in on the educational adventure. While my father only came to larger events, he spent every weekend helping me clean their cages, often a disgusting endeavor. Sometimes, if I was lucky, he'd surprise me by cleaning all of the cages before I woke up, saving me from a shitty weekend. <laughs> we had about 17 large cages stacked on top of each other and piles of food and sawdust. Twice a day, I fed and watered them, and once a week, I put them in a pen outside while my father and I cleaned their cages. Throughout the day, I'd take different ones out to play and cuddle, but eventually we had so many, I couldn't give them all my full attention like I used to. My golden tip of Goody went best to show at the fair. Then a day later, a stupid kid got a hold of him and threw him in the air, making his body seize so furiously that the vet made us put him down. I cried for days. His half Himalayan babies looked adorable, but weren't showable, so a local pet store took them in and gave them what I hope were good homes. After over a year of breeding, I finally had my perfect dark black-tipped Himalayan pups. I was so excited to reign at the f this year's fair. I worked with them daily to ensure better handling during the show and fed them parsley to boost their coats. I was ready. Then... 
about a month before the show, my father was diagnosed with leukemia. My whole world turned upside down. In a matter of days, everything in my life changed. The doctors said it would be years before my father's immune system could handle animals in the house. So we had to get rid of one dog, two cats, and 25 guinea pigs. My little 12-year-old heart was broken. I was old enough to understand the danger of cancer, but too young to handle the auxiliary consequences. I understood that my guinea pigs could kill my father, but I refused to understand why he couldn't just avoid the guinea pig room. My loyalty was torn between my father and my babies. I'd fallen in love with their round faces, their loud squeaks, even their smell, a mix between ammonia, sawdust, and something inexplicably similar to nutmeg. I'd spent years domesticating, training, breeding, loving these babies, and now they were gone, sold at a breeder's event, off to win best of show for other folks. My dad survived his long battle, but I never went back to breeding guinea pigs. By the time we could have pets again, I was old enough for a real pig. And my parents urged me, and my parents urged me to please get an animal that didn't have to live in our house. We still call the little room off our house the guinea pig room, but now it stores unused ex exercise equipment and plastic bins full of my mom's crafting supplies. Last year, I went back to the old fairgrounds and saw rows upon rows of cavies from all over the county. As a kid ran past me, carrying his guinea pig to the big show, I couldn't help but think, you know what, kid? I bred guinea pigs before it was cool. 